So hello, my name is James Hayward and I'm from Homes England's Local Government Capacity Centre. I'm delighted to welcome you to our Winter Learning Programme. This offers a series of knowledge sharing sessions on topics you've told us are of interest to you. Today's event, as I've mentioned, is Biodiversity Net Gain. So the Winter Learning Programme is brought to you by Homes England's new Local Government Capacity Centre, which launched last June in 2021. So this summarises who we are and what we do in front of you. We've launched the centre following extensive research and consultation with you across local government and with a whole range of other partners to determine where authorities need most support and how this can best be delivered. So if we just go to the next slide, I'll introduce a word from our CEO, Peter Denton. As you can see, Peter is committed to ensuring Homes England supports your work and shares expertise, experience and skills to get homes built. And on to the next slide, please. I'll just take you through an agenda for today's session. So Lisa Palfreman, our Senior Technical Manager at Homes England, will talk about biodiversity net gain as a general overview. Then we'll move on to Martina Gavan, uh, the technical director at Arcadis and Liam Price, an ecologist at Arcadis, to get, give a planning perspective on biodiversity net gain. Then we'll go to Paul Britton, our senior manager of planning and enabling at Homes England, who will just give you an overview of one of our case studies at Coy Pool Park in Plymouth. And then I'm going to come back in at the end to chair a Q&A where we're going to just deliver some sessions to the different speakers and try and get a bit of a conversation going. So without any further ado, I'll hand over to Lisa Palfreman. Lisa. Thank you, James. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, as James mentioned, um, I'm Senior Technical Manager Environment and I lead on Biodiversity Net Gain at Homes England. So in my session, I'll cover the basic principles of BNG, the forthcoming requirements under the Environment Act, and particularly talk about Homes England's interest in BNG as a developer. So this may particularly be of interest to you if you're bringing forward development schemes of any sort um, as a public body. Next slide, please. So I've introduced myself and we'd like to know who's listening in today. So we're starting with a poll and I'd like you to all to vote as soon as the poll comes up in the chat box. So I'm interested to know which of the following best describes your role. So we've got a range of options, property and estates, parks and green spaces, housing, transport, planning ecology, other technicals. So once the poll comes up, if you could just vote on the uh, the description that best fits your role. Okay, we've got some votes coming in now. I can see planning's popular. We've got people involved in housing as well and some from property and estates. Okay, so we've got over 200 responses and certainly planning is the most popular category, but also we've got colleagues from housing and, and from property too and one or two from parks and ecology. OK, so certainly, yeah, planning is the, the main um, area of interest. So we'll move on then to the next slide, please. So starting off with thinking about what biodiversity get, net gain actually is. So biodiversity is a term that's used to describe the variety of life. So the variety of species, ecosystems, habitats. Um, net gain is an approach to development that leaves the natural environment in a measurably better state than before and we'll be exploring this later in the in the session um, the example i've put up here is homes england's avenue scheme in chesterfield so the avenue project um, was led by homes england and its predecessor bodies and it's one of the most significant brownfield projects ever undertaken in the uk so the coking works that were on this site closed in 1992 and they left a legacy of derelict plant heavy pollution, including open tar lagoons, waste tips containing asbestos and then contamination, of course, of the soil and, and water, groundwater as well. So the project took 18 years from inception in, in terms of the remediation and landscaping works. And it really shows what can be done with even the most difficult of sites. Now that the remediation works are complete, the new community is being developed on the site by Homes England. So we've got construction of hundreds of new homes underway and a primary school and community facility to follow. The brand new country park um, opened in 2018 and it's now managed by the Land Trust and wildlife is really thriving in the landscaped areas. So I visited back in September, I saw a, a kingfisher and a stoat um, and the areas used for, for uh, local groups to monitor the, the plants and, and birds that are on site as well. So although the avenue predates the formal requirement for BNG, it's clear that development can indeed leave the natural environment in a better state than before and also deliver major benefits for the community. Next slide, please. So how does BNG work on sites? So it's all about delivering a net gain. And there's three scenarios, really. 
around how this can be done. So the scenario A is where a developer delivers a new development scheme and within the red line boundary on the same site also creates some more new, more distinctive habitats. So some rarer or uh, more valuable habitats and or enhances the existing habitats, their condition. And that um, in total delivers a net gain within the development site. Scenario B is where the developer um, can't do net gain within the development site, but can instead secure gains on other local lands. And that could be land that they own or control, um, or it could be via the planning authority or a third party. And again, that delivers the target level of net gain. Scenario C will be available in the future, and that's where there's no local offset option available. And so there's going to be a new uh, credit scheme which the government will run. And basically developers will be able to pay into that scheme and the government will use the funds to deliver improvements for nature anywhere in the country. Next slide, please. So thinking about the Environment Act, because this will be bringing in mandatory BNG to England, um, that will be required at a level of at least 10% and the BNG will need to be secured for 30 years. So this is subject to a two year transition period, so will be taking effect in November 2023. And the way it will be enforced is through a new general condition on all planning permissions granted in England under the Town and Country Planning Act. There will be a limited number of exemptions and actually the government's consulting right now on exemptions and a range of other issues. Um, that consultation is out and runs until the uh, beginning of April. So the Act also introduces BNG for nationally significant infrastructure projects, but we won't talk about that in the session today. But the kinds of projects that are covered under the Town and Country Planning Act include uh, most sort of local commercial residential schemes, local transport infrastructure and so on. So much of the development that will be relevant to your organisations. In the interim, the National Planning Policy Framework, MPPF, already refers to measurable net gains. So some local plans already require BNG to be delivered through uh, development proposals and at a specified level of 10% or occasionally more than that. Next slide, please. So um, in terms of the Environment Act in a bit more detail, what it will require is that developers have submitted and had approved by the planning authority a biodiversity gain plan in order to get planning permission. And this will cover the developers' plans to minimise impacts on habitats. It'll have the measurements in place as well, so the pre and projected post-development biodiversity value. And we'll talk more about measurement a bit later. And that's got to show at least a 10% gain. Any off-site biodiversity credits and gains that are needed to get to that 10% level. And then because we're talking about securing this for 30 years, a habitat management and monitoring plan. The government consultation proposes that at an earlier stage when the planning application is put in, the developer also provides biodiversity information and that's uh, the information that's available in terms of things like the biodiversity baseline at that earlier stage so that the planning application provides the information needed to inform the decision. The Environment Act also includes an enhanced public sector biodiversity duty, so public bodies needing to have regard to enhancing as well as conserving biodiversity as part of their policy or decision making. And also a requirement, a new requirement to report on biodiversity actions taken and planned um, every five years. Next slide, please. So other aspects in the Environment Act in terms of offsite gains, there's going to be a, a new legal mechanism of a conservation covenant, which would basically be an agreement between a landowner and a responsible body, um, such as uh, uh, an NGO or um, a public body. And that means that conservation can be secured on that site for the long term. And it doesn't matter if the landowner, um, the, the land changes hands in the future. The covenant will require the landowner, whoever they are, to do something or to not do something to achieve conservation aims. So perhaps it could be um, grazing of grassland in order to ensure that grassland is um, in good condition. There will be the government credit scheme that I mentioned earlier um, and the provisions will be brought in for that and also a public biodiversity gain site register which particularly means that off-site uh, BNG will need to be registered on there by the developer giving details of the habitats that are to be created, um, which development site is being covered and so on. There's also uh, the introduction of local nature recovery strategies which will be introduced um, across England, around 50 of them with no gaps or overlaps and these will be locally led to help ensure that spatial plans um, reflect biodiversity um, that's already there and also uh, targets around recovery of nature as well. And from a BNG point of view, it should help direct investment for nature, particularly off-site uh, BNG, into the right locations. Next slide, please. 
just some essential principles for BNG. It's important to recognise that um, BNG is a new requirement, but it doesn't alter the existing protection for sites such as triple SIs, nor for habitats and species that already have protection in law. So, for example, great crested newts and other uh, protected species requirement at the moment is for a mitigation licence if development is likely to impact on uh, populations of those. And those requirements are unaffected by the introduction of BNG. Development um, applicants still need to undertake broader ecological impact assessment for development proposals. So that may include surveys for protected species or other uh, ecological information that needs to be submitted in agreement with the planning authority. The mitigation hierarchy is a really important principle. So this means with all development proposals, the idea under the MPPF is to avoid impacts as a first step. And that could be through changes to the layout or um, other changes. And then making sure that impacts are mitigated as well. So try to reduce the impacts and only then look for compensation as a sort of a last resort if, if um, impacts can't be further reduced. And enhancement opportunities need to be sought all the way through the process of um, coming up with the, the master plan and developing that. So BNG is very much as part of the, the uh, avoid um, and enhance uh, process. Irreplaceable habitats such as ancient woodland are outside the scope of BNG. So if impacts on ancient irreplaceable habitats can't be avoided, then there needs to be an agreement between the planning authority and the developer about bespoke compensation. And finally, BNG needs to be measured using a consistent approach. And the way in that's, which that's been done is through the biodiversity metric 3.0. So I'll go on to talk about that next. Next slide, please. So yeah, the, the uh, metric three was uh, published by Natural England last summer. And it's basically an area-based measure of the biodiversity value of a site using habitats as a proxy for all biodiversity. So we're not going to go away and count birds and species or count the number of uh, flower types on a site. We're looking at habitat types and using that to measure the biodiversity baseline. So the way in which it's done is to look at the size um, or the length of the habitat in the case of rivers and hedgerows. Ecologists um, need to be going on to site um, basically classifying all of the different habitats and that comes with a distinctiveness score for those habitats and then assessing the condition of the, the habitat on that particular site. So looking at the habitat using condition criteria to try to assess how good is this habitat compared to a, a model one that's in full working order. There's a score for strategic significance which is around whether there are habitats reflected in uh, sort of planning policy and then once that exercise has been done for all the habitats on the site, you end up with a, a score like in the pink box, which is the pre-biodiversity units, which is basically the baseline value. The exercise is then repeated based on the scheme design to understand the size of loss or gain on the site. So basically going through the process again, but looking at the predicted um, habitat condition um, and, and types on site and also adding in the risk multipliers. So if you plant trees tomorrow, you don't end up with a woodland next month. You're talking about years um, in order to get to that woodland to good condition. And so the risk multipliers are used to basically um, account for that within the, the calculation. So basically a comparison then between the post biodiversity units and the pre biodiversity units is done to see if you've got to the target amount of net gain, 10 percent or more. And there's separate measurements then for linear habitats as well, the hedgerows and rivers. Next slide, please. So just two examples of habitats on Homes England sites. So this is the Northern Arts Scheme in West Sussex. And actually these two habitats are forming um, an extension to the adjoining nature reserve because this is a large scale scheme of around three and a half thousand new homes to the north of Burgess Hill. So on the left hand side, we've got a, a very high distinctiveness habitat, which is really undevelopable um, in this location. We wouldn't want to, it's, but it's part of the nature reserve extension. Um, lowland meadow being very high distinctiveness, um, it, but in this situation, it was judged as moderate condition. So it can be brought into better condition to good condition um, by better management. So one annual cut of the grassland areas with the clippings removed to avoid nutrient input to the grounds. And that favours a variety of flowering grass and um, other species. So here it's in moderate condition, but opportunity to get to good. And on the right hand side, we've got lowland mixed deciduous woodland. Again, here it was judged in moderate condition. So by bringing it into better management, we can ensure that there's an increase in biodiversity, bring it into a good condition. Next slide, please. So here's the base baseline summary just for this part of the site. And you can see the habitat types are listed. And then we've got the scores and the associated biodiversity units. And whether uh, the habitat types repeated, that's because part of the um, area is in poor condition and part of it's in moderate condition. 
And you can see how that adds up to 159 biodiversity baseline units. So this exercise is repeated for all of the, the site, including the development areas where you may have a mix of um, street trees and parks and open spaces and informal green space, as well as development areas. And then the comparison is made between the baseline and the development after um, the, it's completed. And for the Northern Arc scheme, we've got a predicted 23% biodiversity net gain. So we've got plans in place to secure, make sure that those gains are actually delivered through the process. Next slide, please. So in terms of us as an organisation preparing for BNG, recognising our role as a developer and bringing forward some very large schemes as well as some much smaller ones, what we've been doing is making sure that we kind of build on our experience previously of planning and delivering ecological improvements. Um, so, for example, the Avenue scheme, um, one of the things that had to be done early on um, was moving some protected species, water voles and grass snakes off the site into a new nature reserve, which we also delivered, the Avenue Washlands Nature Reserve. So we've got experience previously of planning and delivering these kind of improvements, and we're just trying to learn from our experience um, to make sure that we do BNG in, the, in a sort of robust way as well. We engaged early with leading organisations on BNG, for example, other government organisations, house builders and organisations like the Land Trust. Um, I established a BNG task and finish group back in 2019, and that was really involving colleagues from across the organisation who have an interest in BNG. So um, from the legal and planning side, but also colleagues that work on disposals um, and environmental uh, colleagues as well to basically look at the emerging requirements and to understand how we could respond to them across the project lifecycle. So thinking about things right from the very beginning, because I think BNG is really effective if you can do it early from the acquisitions process right through to the disposals. Expertise and capacity building, so offering learning sessions across the organisation and having a new technical services team which included a biodiversity function um, so that we can support colleagues with the more complex issues. Um, and obviously, um, people use consultants for the big schemes, but we need to also make sure that we're doing things consistently and that's what the function helps to achieve. Data gathering, so back in 2020, we ran a survey to find out how many homes and schemes are already planning for delivering BNG, responding to local requirements, and that's helped us sort of plan some of our other activities. And then sharing best practice externally. So, for example, um, you can see on the left hand side, um, I spoke on BBC Country File showing uh, the work that was being done on the Northern Arc scheme um, as part of a piece that they were doing to explore um, some of the challenges and opportunities around BNG. Next slide, please. So we come to poll number two here. So it's just coming up in the chat box. So interested to know, is your organisation planning to review its land holdings for BNG potential? So answers yes, no, maybe, or don't know. So what we've got coming through at the moment, um, majority of people say don't know, but we do have around 18% of people saying yes, 16%. Uh, a, large, a smaller number as well say maybe. So we're up to about 20, 229 responses. And it's still the case that most people don't know, but there are people who are doing this actively now. OK, so we leave it there. 14% said yes, they are planning to review um, land holdings for BNG potential. So that's really interesting. Next slide, please. So that's something that we're doing ourselves in house. Um, so it's really around making the best use of public assets. We've got a portfolio of land that has no development potential. And so what we've been doing um, is looking at those sites to see whether we could use them for BNG or another environmental intervention. So we appointed Arcadis from the Homes England framework to, to do this project. Um, Arcadis last summer collected biodiversity baseline data for every site, completed the calculations that I've explained here, and to identify then the, the uplift potential, how much BNG could we deliver if we put in place appropriate ecological interventions. So it could be tree planting, it could be um, grassland management and so on. So basically what we're doing is using these findings to, for firstly to match up non-development sites with nearby agency schemes that might need off-site BNG, but also if, if there isn't such a scheme nearby, to talk to local partners about how these sites could best be used for BNG or other environmental opportunities to really make the best use of these assets. Next slide, please. And finally, just to round up around sort of our future priorities on this, um, I'm focusing very much on upskilling colleagues who so offering more open training sessions. And for some colleagues, um, particularly those working on the technical engineering side on their states and valuations, to make sure that they um, understand more about BNG, particularly around how BNG is measured. Um, so we can factor it in really from the earliest stages. I'm doing a board teaching for our uh, board and executive leadership team so that they understand BNG and can think about it more strategically as well, and offering tips and guidance on key issues. 
we're strengthening our internal processes across the project life cycle to making sure that we address BNG, particularly on acquisitions and disposals to make sure that the delivery is actually achieved and looking again at um, best use of our assets. We're gathering more evidence and data, so we're running the survey again right now to see how our schemes are responding to BNG and also to understand better around things around costs for BNG as well. And finally, we're engaging with others in the industry, again, house builders and with other parts of government to really learn um, to anticipate what the, the changes, how the changes might affect our activities and also to promote best practice with others too. Next slide, please. OK, so that's it from me and I'll now hand over to, to Liam and Martina to talk from Arcadis. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, so as Lisa says, uh, Martina Gerben and myself will be speaking today. Martina is the head of UK Ecology at Arcadis, um, and I'm an ecologist at Arcadis as well. Uh, and we're going to talk today about some of our experiences with delivering biodiversity and again in a practical context. Uh, next slide, please. Oh uh, yeah, just do a quick overview. So as um, Lisa touched on in her slide as well, the options for delivery, just to highlight those again. I'll go through a number of case studies that we've got before moving on to key considerations, a bit of a summary at the end and future directions of, um, of this topic. Our next slide, please. As just to highlight this again, as this will be a theme throughout um, our presentation, the options for delivery of biodiversity net gain. So starting with on-site, does what it says in the tin, doing it within the red line boundary, and then two off-site options, two categories of off-site option. Uh, the first being a homegrown approach, so working collaboratively with um, with a partner to deliver biodiversity units um, at, a, at an offsite location. And then the other category, these pay and walk away type schemes where uh, one type is private trading, which we're seeing more and more of where uh, units are bought and sold effectively. And finally, the government credit scheme, which details are pending, shall we say, we're awaiting further um, um, further clarification on the exact specifics of this, but this is in effect the government providing a last resort option for developers that require units. Um, and the key point here that again we'll, we'll touch on throughout that, you know, needing to justify why you're moving down this hierarchy. So why can't you do it on site? Okay, why can you not work up a, a you know, why is it not feasible to work up a, a homegrown option before moving on to these, um, these pay and walk away type uh, options? Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so our next um, uh, poll, which should be coming up on your screen now. Um, so which of these uh, approaches would you be able to facilitate? So they've got several examples on the screen there and I'll have a look in the chat to see what um, what uh, answers we get people are giving. Uh, so moving on while those start. Oh, no, it's come up. Uh, so immediately we're seeing most either in the um, don't know or on-site design or oh, actually all of the above. So we'll, we'll, we'll touch on this a bit more in the case studies, but um, there are obvious benefits to on-site um, and on-site approach is the site of the, uh, the impact, uh, whereas off-site options do have the advantage that they can provide valuable improvements to the local area as well. Uh, so moving on to the next slide, please. Uh, just a few um, tips for the um, on-site, uh, for delivery of on-site biodiversity units before we move on to the case studies. Um, so everything within the red line boundary should be included in the on-site area. So anything that is within the red line of the development should be included. Um, Lisa touched on a few exceptions there with uh, uh, irreplaceable habitats and um, designated sites as well. Um, it shouldn't be part of an existing commitment. So if, for example, there are existing commitments related to protected species mitigation, for example, um, that is something you're already committed to doing, so it shouldn't be counted. Any land owned by the applicant that is outside of the red line boundary is still categorised as off-site land and should be treated accordingly within the metric. Um, this, this point around the baseline would be considered January 2020. So the point that the legislation is trying to cover off here is that, um, to, or to try and prevent, I should say, is that if land is devalued prior to the assessment of the baseline, it would then be easier to achieve um, a 10% net gain because you've artificially lowered the baseline. So what the legislation is getting at here is that if 
a site has had its value reduced since January 2020, which is when the uh, Environment Bill was first introduced, then the baseline should be taken back to that point. So that's to try and deter, you know, a, an unscrupulous developer clearing a site of, of woodland and any habitats of value prior to assessing the baseline. Uh, and finally, um, it's often better both practical practically for nature but also within the metric to enhance habitats rather than you know losing habitats than to try and recreate them and the final bullet point there do no harm so the key take a message here is that um you know we're trying to ha make a benefit for nature for biodiversity and that should be a theme that runs throughout your thinking rather than getting lost within the numbers and within the metric uh, next slide please uh, and this is our first case study, and we'll be handing over to Martina to talk through this one. Hello, thank you very much, Liam. And um, uh, Liam and I will be sort of swapping back and forwards as we discuss various case studies. Um, if we can have the next slide, um, I think there's some animation on it. Thank you. So the first thing we're going to talk about is um, what is often the most desirable and most effective way of um, uh, of of having net gain which is designing it on site. Now this is one where we looked at nearly 600 hectares of greenfield land and a development for um, uh, over 8,000 houses and from the very beginning we wanted to look at it from a landscape scale so before anybody started to get the pens out and put, put housing on it we looked at what was there already. Next slide please. So looking at the key sort of areas which had the most ecosystem um, natural capital value and, and marking those as such and then sort of ranking these sort of different areas was able to start the master plan from the very beginning, making sure we were retaining and buffering those important areas. Next slide, please. Also, what's really important is to look at the how you can enhance connectivity within and um, out uh, of your site as well, because that connectivity, which isn't currently covered in the net, net gain uh, metrics, is obviously really important. Next slide, please. Um, and then we're looking about where on site can biodiversity be kind of the pri primary function of an area? Where um, can it be a secondary function? Where is it going to just sort of make in, um, muck in, make do and mend? And the really important thing here is getting to together with other disciplines and saying, well, if you do have a, uh, an urban suds feature, can we maximise the benefits for biodiversity? Next slide, please. Um, looking at the actual um, buffering, looking at um, what habitat is going where and doing that at the very beginning with the landscape team, with the water team, uh, for example, then we really were making sure that every bit of land was sort of maximised and that was agreed um, in, in very early on. Next slide, please. Um, so then next thing was to come up with a, a master plan which reflected um, those aspirations. Next slide, please. Um, and and that's that's how we ended up with um, this master plan, which we've got community gardens, allotments, woodland burial burial grounds, um, suds areas, water treat water treatment areas, which are actually um, fantastic for wildlife as well. And then looking at the net gain before and after in this um, next slide, please. In this example. Um, because it was an intensively farmed landscape in in Kent. So if you could do if you could click through some animation. Thank you. It was an intensively farmed landscape in Kent. We were able to take this approach. We were able to enhance uh, um, a lot of land. A lot of it was arable uh, pasture. Um, so in this circumstance, we were able to generate 20% net gain on site. If you could just click through now, next slide, please. Thank you. But that's not available. You know, that's not an opportunity that that's always um, possible. In that case, we did our 50% green infrastructure. We were involved right at the very beginning. Um, all of our um, landscape features were designed to maximise their natural capital and ecosystem function as well. So appreciate that that's not always available, but that gives us the most control. Uh, when we are um, looking at evaluating that as well, it's providing benefits, a lot of benefits to the, the local people and um, and driving you know, resilient communities. I'm going to hand over to Liam again, who's going to talk about uh, another uh, diff a few different approaches, and then he's going to hand back to me for some other case studies. Thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, so the point of this slide here is to highlight the range of potential off-site delivery partners that are available. And um, this is just obviously uh, a, um, a few examples. And really, the the, sort of the sky's the limit. And you know, it's valuable to look at the local context, look at what would be valuable in the local context, and who might be a, a useful collaborator there. So you know, environmental charities have a lot of experience and land that may benefit from improvement, and you know, things that they'd like to do, but money might be short. Landowners and landowners and farmers. Um, businesses, schools, all all may have land in some form and things they'd like to do. Um, you know, organisations that may have corporate social responsibility requirements or key performance indicators that they that they need to meet in relation to biodiversity. So, the key message here is that there's a load of different organisations that may um, may be interested in collaborating on biodiversity units. And we'll talk through in the next few case studies about um, a few examples that we've worked with. Uh, so next slide, please. As this um, this case study is relating to um, a development called Northstow, um, it's a quite a large development really to the north of Cambridge. Um, we're going to be focusing on phase three uh, in this uh, in this case study, um, and Homes England in this case um, set themselves a voluntary target of fifteen percent uh, biodiversity net gain uh, for this um, for this stage of the development. And if you can go on to the next slide, please. Uh, so in this case, uh, you can see the illustrative um, the master plan up there. I mean, you can see that. It is more limited in terms of green space. We, re we really try to maximise the, um, the multifunctional value of green space as much as possible to really um, get the most benefit out of the, the land for, from a biodiversity point of view, from the local residents point of view, all that sort of thing. Um, but still, we weren't able to achieve enough value that we, we didn't need to look off site as well. Um, and if we flick on to the next slide, please, you'll see that um, you can see that area of offsetting um, land that we are um, developing um, an offsetting scheme for uh, in relation to phase 3A and phase 3B. And essentially what we're trying to do here was meet various requirements for the scheme, namely biodiversity units and farmland and bird offsetting, but also um, retain its value to the, to the current tenants of the land. And if you flick on to the next slide, please. Um, you'll see um, those points there. So the farm bird mitigation, the biodiversity units, but equally to try and re retain its value as a working farm, keep it workable, um, maximising environmental net gain to take it beyond just biodiversity. And also with an eye on countryside stewardship and with an eye on elms in the future as well to really try and make sure that this land, we, we get maximal value from this land. And if you go on to the next slide, please. Uh, so I won't I won't talk through this in detail, but essentially you can see the, the proposals here that you know most of it will be dominated by um, sort of a, a conservation grazed grassland to try and achieve a species rich sward. There'll be buffers around the edge of the land, especially next to the watercourses. Um, additional features like beetle banks and you know um, uh, wildlife boxes for wildlife and that sort of thing. Um, you can see here we've attempted to align it with the countryside country or we have aligned it with the countryside stewardship um, system as well to try and um, uh, make sure that the the people that are managing it are the farmers it's in a format that they understand so it's in a you, you're trying to um, uh, aim it at its target audience. So if you're working with the Wildlife Trust, for example, where they've got a lot more experience with habitat management, um, you, you target the management requirements differently to if you've got a landowner that's, that's familiar with countryside stewardship, but unfamiliar with biodiversity um, net gain. I think on to the next slide, please. Uh, so this is um, a scheme that we're currently working on um, with a government company. They've got a biodiversity KPI that we're helping them to meet through identifying homegrown um, opportunities with local stakeholders. Uh, you can see we've identified a range in the little green dots in the map on the left. Um, the contrast doesn't look, it's, look like it's come out great, but you can see them in the south and in the north, um, northwest as well. Uh, so the key points here are that you know we engage with a wide range of stakeholders and by exploring this homegrown um, approach, we were able to achieve substantial cost savings um, uh, for, for the client. So you, you can see with the variation there that, you know, we'll come on to this with the key points at the end, but, you know, we did um, find quite a range of engagement levels. In some areas, there were loads of um, uh, uh, partners that were keen to, keen to get involved, whereas in other areas, there were, there were a lot fewer. 
So that's something that's important to bear in mind. If you are looking at offsite opportunities, the earlier that you engage, the more likely you are to be able to find a, a part, a delivery partner that is um, that is keen to be involved. I can go on to the next slide, please. Um, and I'll hand over to Martine, who's going to talk through a few more case studies, including those for uh, small sites as well. Thank you, Liam. So obviously, we don't we don't always have vast you know, amounts of of um, greenfield land with which to work with, and actually, very small amounts of land in suburban or urban areas can be very meaningful. So this was one where we had a piece of land that had sort of just just been left to, to its own devices. Thames it was Thames Water Site, and they had an easement on the site, and they gifted the easement um, to a school to to uh, develop an ecotherapy garden uh, and outside teaching facilities, which is what we did. And it, it was um, if we could have the next the next next slide it was actually very much full of um a lot a lot of bramble which in itself is very nice but um it, the the wooden was unmanaged and it wasn't sort of doing its best in terms of functionality and it also was a ground for a lot of dog poo which was flung into the site so we actually looked at it and um we made a management plan for the site to manage the woodland and to put up bat boxes and bird boxes to uh make sure there was there were boundary features, uh, uh, wood piles for, for fungi and for sheltering. Um, and actually, we've also introduced water onto the site in, in, um, in the form of a pond. And it's actually used for, for children from the, the school, Treehouse School, who have sort of complex needs and uh, working with ambitions about autism. Um, it's, a, it's a school especially for children with complex um, uh, needs uh, due to autism. And the the difference in actually being in wildlife and being taught in wildlife is made to them and their teachers has been um, really outstanding. And now they're also monitoring the wildlife that's there as well as managing it on a regular basis. So this was a small amount of land that you might sort of call sort of orphaned land. And I think there is quite a lot of that around that really benefits. So at the minute, the the, the management of this land is, is self-sustaining. And they actually charge companies to come and do um, to do volunteer days uh, there. They sell uh, vegetables to the community and they have an over 50s group that also come and support. It, it's really a vibrant um, addition to a community and it, and, and it really has transformed um, the, the lives of some of the children who are able to do things they never thought they'd be able to do. The next, next slide, please. <clears throat> and in recognition of this, um, this uh, this did actually win a, a biodiversity um, challenge award, a Syria one for um, for the actual community engagement. So you can do quite a lot with small areas of land and it needn't be expensive either. And this model actually is something <clears throat> that we've introduced with an, another um, not for profit group called Grow to Know, who are looking at um, maximising the value of, of green estates. Um, you may notice that a lot of green estates and even parks in urban areas are what we might call green deserts. So they are green, but there's very little biodiversity there. And we're working with Grow to Know to actually go into the local community, engage that community in actually creating more biodiverse environments. And with working with what you've got, you can make an, an enormous change and uplift biodiversity, but also have that community cohesion. Um, next slide, please. Now, in the questions, we've noticed one about brownfield sites um, and absolutely brownfield uh, sites or open mosaic habitat. It's very highly uh, valued in <clears throat> the, the biodiversity metric. Um, but if you were following the metric sort of to the letter, that would make some of these sites not feasible for development. So we had um, a scenario just like that where we had um, a commercial development for the site. It was on open mosaic habitat, but there was a lot of other mosaic um, habitat in the area, which is actually better quality. And to actually develop it to the letter would have been completely unfeasible. <clears throat> so instead, we looked at retaining um, and enhancing what we could on site, and, and some of that was open mosaic habitat. But actually, um, uh, Peterborough had um, uh, initiative which was looking at uh, road verges where we were able to uh, put funding into that so it's not replacing completely like for like however the biodiversity enhancement and the um, the connectivity that those um, opportunities were going to provide 
were actually potentially of much greater biodiversity value than uh, going and replacing open mosaic habitat in a local community which already had a lot of open mosaic habitat. So I think it is really important to consider the context of your scheme and to get people around the table and and, and say, you know, you know, what what is it that you're looking for? Obviously, we're, we're complying with all the legislative requirements and reprovisioning habitat for, for species on site um, as well. But that's one of the examples where it was just not feasible to do what it, it would have been um, to the letter of the law. Uh, next next slide, please. Now, we do have some of our own data coming up on this, which uh, Liam is going to discuss. But what we'd like to know is what you personally would consider value for money uh, for a biodiversity unit. Um, so at the minute, we're looking at sort of around sort of up to 10K, up to 20,000 or up to 30,000. Or do you just not have a clue uh, at all where it should be pitched? And that's something that um, so Liam will, will, will actually get a bit of the data that we've gathered from some of the projects that we have done. So I'm looking at the results coming in. Got a lot of do not knows, okay. Um, and they were looking that 20k mark is looking to be about the most um, popular. Thank you. Um, next slide, please. Um, so again, we've seen some questions in the chat about management and monitoring. And again, how that how that happens is something to think about at the outset and negotiate. And you may be able to have farmers and have uh, local friends of groups, community groups actually manage the land. So while you know the developer will be responsible for ensuring that land is um, managed and maintained, you could outsource that uh, and have um, with an oversight. It's, it's really important to have simple positive interventions because while, for example, a farmer will be responsible for those interventions and making sure those interventions are done, they cannot be held responsible really for delivering the net gain. Um, uh, I mean, a lot of this may be uh, worked out in the future, but I, I would liken it to the protected species license system we have at the moment, for example, whereby if you're creating a pond, say, for great cut and use in someone's habitat, you still have a named ecologist that's responsible and the client is still responsible and the person who's landed on if you have contracted them for, for positive management um, interventions then that, that is their arrangement with, with you and, and having target target KPIs again this management and monitoring without target KPIs obviously that we've got biodiversity net gain is one of them but actually to see where you're going in terms of injurious weeds desirable species you must have target communities really um, mapped out um, and just we're talking about the the adoption it, it, many different ways it can be done um, I think the important thing is to engage the, state, the stakeholders and make sure that you do have enough budget up front to to cover that and we'll talk uh, a little bit later as well Liam's going to talk in more detail about risks um, and risks to delivery so if targets aren't being met obviously that's when you should have op uh, options built into your your monitoring and management strategy to go and change that management so it's it's really um, important again the duration is something that I, I think a lot of people are still um, sort of querying. Some people would like to see in perpetuity actually mean in perpetuity, um, but at the moment it's it's looking at thirty years. Uh, next slide, please. So I think Liam is going to. I'm going to hand over to Liam. He's going to talk about some of the challenges and risks, and he's also going to talk about some of the the monetary values that um, that we've had on, in our schemes. Thank you. Uh, so just um, as Martin said, a few um, a few of the challenges that we found going through um, this process. So in the first step, you know, the key first step being identifying an opportunity with a, you know, with a homegrown opportunity. And I touched on it before with the, the varying levels of stakeholder engagement. So the earlier that you start looking into try and engage with the local um, local potential stakeholders, the better. Um, potentially conflicting visions and needs. So the needs of the developer likely around biodiversity units, around um, specific habitat types to try and make sure that, you know, if woodland's being lost on the site, we're replacing those biodiversity units with woodland, trying to keep within the same habitat type. Um, whereas the, um, the, 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 the stakeholder, the collaborator may have differing views or needs for the, um, um, the area, for example, instead of planting woodland, they'd like a wildflower meadow, for example. Um, and that's that point around the, the right units be developed. So, you know, can we can we get the broad habitat type aligned or, you know, in certain cases, it may be that the, the right units are what is important to the local area, what would really benefit or what 
would the local area benefit from? Uh, the <coughs> amount of time taken for negotiation um, shouldn't be underestimated in our experience that these agreements can be quite complicated exactly who's responsible for what who's paying for what and that sort of thing so making sure that uh, you know the lead in time allows for that um, the secondary legislation around the environment act is still incoming so um, there are still elements of uncertainty that hopefully will be clarified a by the secondary legislation but also you know as we get more um, cases and examples through uh, to give a bit more detail about what's what's expected in terms of um you know for example the, the the duration of the agreement and responsibilities and all that sort of thing we are seeing already an increase in the demand um for units and the prices um so you know the price of land increasing if you start talking about you're doing biodiversity you're using it for biodiversity net gain um and that we only expect that to increase you know the 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 use for biodiverse net gain, but also the use for you know carbon credits and all that sort of thing. Um, and finally, delivery risks. So the value of a contingency pot if something goes wrong, either um, sort of force majeure on unexpected circumstances, whether it you know someone decides they're going to have a, a barbecue in the middle of your nice grassland and it burns down 15 years into the agreement, or you know someone decides they're going to drive their car all over it. What what happens then? And having um, agreements in place for those scenarios. So who 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 does the risk lie with? And that will depend on the agreement, what parties are looking for, if it's a homegrown opportunity, as we phrased it, or a pay and walk away type scheme. If you can go on the next slide, please. As this slide. Um, the, these are the typical ranges that we found um, for cost and a few other details as well uh, in terms of the viability. So on site, developing on site units, it's typically low risk because it's your site, you control it, you control the management of it. Again, potentially lower cost for the same reasons. And you also have opportunity to deliver ecosystem services um, as would benefit the local area. Uh, homegrown offsite opportunities, we have seen quite a varying cost that, um, as you'd expect, really, that if you're if it's a, a private business that's paying contractors to come and do the management, it's likely to be more expensive. Whereas if it's um, a charitable trust, um, then, you know, they may have a volunteer resource or workforce that they can use to maintain the habitat and manage it um, and does have the advantage of being bespoke to the situation. Uh, the 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 private trading route it can be very quick which is a distinct advantage if that's what you're looking for but it is typically more expensive it's not typically tailored to the opportunity with limited opportunities for ecosystem service delivery and this we've tended to find more in the 20 to 30 thousand pound mark and finally the off-the-shelf government credit route again as with the private trading um, but again we're expecting that to be even more expensive still to really discourage um, this route from re from being um, from being taken by developers and again the the, the the appetite for risk the speed of delivery required um, the local context will influence which of these options that you're looking to take and you can go on to the next slide please uh, so our final poll of our section of presentation. Uh, so where do you think the risk should lie um, in the case of unforeseen circumstances for off-site delivery? So I touched on that before that if you have a, you know a failure of establishment of some of some crop or you know the fire in an area of woodland, for example. Uh, so let's open the chat to see what uh, responses that we're getting. Uh, so. Uh, while that's coming in, um, we'll just move on to the um, move on to the summary slide, and we'll come back to that um, to have a look at what um, what you thought. And I'll pass back to Martina to sum up. Thanks, Liam. So I think you know what what we're also saying is the metric is important, and it's fantastic that we've got numbers on this because before we had numbers, we didn't have a very strong position. But not to just design to the metric, just to look at what actually fits with a local character what 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 you need in that area and um, what what species needs are are the required and and to do it from the outset i mean we, we do always say that but it is true um you will develop a biodiversity net gain for a much more attractive price if you can get someone in from the beginning and make sure that they are engaging with all the different disciplines and maximizing the value of the land that you have um exhausting those on-site opportunities before you look off-site because we don't want to develop you know urban deserts we don't want to continue with that 
Um, you look at connectivity as well. And, and I think it, it will move on to a, just a bit of closing, closing thoughts on environmental net gain, where um, we talk about sort of people as well. Um, just be mindful of the time it takes when you are negotiating offsite opportunities when you're growing them yourselves you can get much you know more cost effective and tailored opportunities uh potentially you know uh, much cheaper management in the, in the long term um but that might take a while to negotiate so everyone will have slightly different visions and you will need to make sure that you are sort of in, in, leaving enough time to make sure that people are happy with that and um, include those contingency costs and risk pot up front. It's always easier at that time to get budget than to, to try and actually sort that out um, later. And again, a good management and monitoring plan will save money because you will be able to make small tweaks and interventions rather than um, waiting until that, that, gets, that gets much worse. Um, next slide, please. So, the BNG uh, it still has some sort of oddities and, and quirks. And again, it's a reminder just not to, to lose sight of the ecology. It's fantastic. It's a, fun, a fantastic tool, not perfect. So always have that um, holistic consultant's head on. Um, we are also, I think lots of planning authorities are looking at is 10% is enough? So some local planning authorities are looking at policy and, and wanting to push that, that further. And then I've seen some questions in the chat about environmental net gain. Now, we do think that environmental net gain is, it's also it's in policy, but I think there's going to be stronger measures to promote environmental net gain. There is a natural England environmental benefits from nature tool being developed. There's quite a few tools, there's a series of benefits from SUDS tools. But while we've got this um, opportunity um, by diversity net gain, we should be thinking that, that how is this affecting people in an urban environment, their access to nature, um, climate resilience. There, there is so much more we can do with this. And I think it's just having that multifunctional head on and thinking from the beginning, you know, what can we what can we deliver um, nature based solutions for carbon carbon reduction and also uh, nutrient neutrality and water neutrality, for example. So I think it's an exciting time. There are a lot of unknowns still, but what is brilliant is that we're seeing these opportunities and we're we're, we're getting on and delivering them and then and hopefully feeding back some of the the challenges and some of the successes through forums like this. And I don't I don't think I think think that might be the end slide. Just again, yeah, there we go. So I'm going to hand over to Paul now. Um, thank you very much. Right, thank you. Um, last fifteen minutes and then. There'll be lots of time to uh, answer all the questions that are coming in. Lots of really good questions, so thank you for those. Um, so yeah, Paul Britton, I work within the development team at Homes England, um, and I'm going to talk about one of our key sites in the southwest, um, Coyple Park in Plymouth. If I could go on to the next slide, please. So very quick overview. Um, so this 30 hectare site is on the north northern edge of Plymouth City, uh, very close to the A38. So anyone that knows Plymouth as you're coming in and you see the Sainsbury's with the, the sales, um, our site is basically um, on the other side of the road to that. It was in industrial use for about 100 years or so. And you can see in terms of the, um, the uh, drone image here, there was an absolutely huge um, cathedral-like tin sheds which were used to process uh, china clay that was um, quarried on Dartmoor. Um, so all, all of those buildings had lots of china clay residue that we've, we've had to uh, deal with over the last couple of years. So um, the operations that were undertaken by Imris closed in 2008 and then the site sat there for 10 years. And as you can see, there's lots of woodland, about 12 hectares of woodland, which goes around the uh, western, northern and eastern uh, boundaries of the site. And that was basically just left to do its own thing for, for 10 years. Um, and so when, when we looked to buy the site, um, I could already see that there was the potential for um, landscape and uh, biodiversity to factor into this site. So it, it was definitely part of the process in terms of when we acquired the site. I wouldn't say that biodiversity net gain was a determining factor on what we paid for the site, um, because back, back in 2018, 
yes, biodiversity net gain was was um, raising in in profile, um, but I think in terms of the cost, they weren't. Um, so we we didn't include it. But I would now, if I was buying the site, if I could go on to the next slide. So the the first key thing that we did was undertake survey work. And this would be my number one recommendation: survey as soon as possible. Um, and you can see in terms of the key habitats, broadleaf woodland, there was some standing water and there were lots of um, uh, hedgerows, um, kind of um, traditional Devonshire hedges um, in lots of the woodland areas. But you can see on the bottom there, um, in terms of primary habitat, apart from the woodland, there wasn't really much else. So in terms of um, our ability to avoid, mitigate and enhance. We were able to basically undertake that on site without requiring any additional substantial green space. So that that again is is a key element um, that came out of the survey work. And you can see in terms of flora and fauna, uh, we've got lots of bats, snakes, um, badgers, etc. Um, I particularly like the, the hairy buttercups as well in terms of the flora uh, on the site. We could go to the next slide. So uh, this this basically all fed into our planning application. We undertook it undertook a huge amount of pre-application work with Plymouth City Council, and that um, both highlighted the ecological elements and the biodiversity net gain elements of the site. We were able to talk that through with the um, the. Uh, Green Environment Team within Plymouth City Council, Natural Environment Team within City Council, um, and come up with ways that we could actually um, look to achieve at least 10% biodiversity net gain. And you can see there that it includes retention and enhancement of the woodland um, and um, encouragement of pollinators, bee bricks. You can see for yourself the kind of the elements that that we included within our planning application. If I could go on to the next slide. Um, so we've got approval for the scheme, unanimous support at committee. Uh, it's just subject to the 106, which, which will hopefully be signed within the next uh, week or two. And there's two key things that I'd like to draw out for this, really. Um, we submitted a landscape and ecological management plan uh, with the planning application. Prior to commencement, that needs to be updated and provide clear evidence that we're meeting at least 10% biodiversity net gain. That's key. And then secondly, in terms of each reserved matter, so each area of the site that comes forward for development, um, we would need to submit a detailed LEMP, which would include details such as bird boxes and, and how we're actually going to achieve 10% biodiversity net gain. So um, those are planning conditions. I know that there's there's a current consideration of whether it's a condition or whether it's within the 106. So again, that's, that's something um, to raise um, within Plymouth. At the moment, it's uh, a condition. We'll go on to the next uh, slide. The stage that we're at now is that we have marketed the site um, and uh, we will be getting into contract with a developer within the next month um, and then work with them to progress reserve matters applications on the site. The way that Homes England deals with our land is that we grant that developer a building lease and then um, we only transfer the freehold once they've actually built the homes. So we have a controlling um, interest in the site. So all reserve matters need our approval. And in terms of assessing biodiversity net gain, we will have a third party consultant that will review what the developer has prepared and ensure that that is um, the case going forward. So we have that long term interest um, and it will be until the last home is built. So we we, we retain that interest. Um, I think also is which would which would be quite useful to mention this stage is that. In terms of the woodland 
and the open spaces, play areas, etc. Um, the intention is that we either transfer them to the city council and then they basically pick up the management um, of the uh, those areas going forward. So there's one opportunity there and obviously in terms of the 30 years plus ability to monitor and manage that, um, city council and local authorities in general have a, have a um, good, good position to, to take on there. Um, or the, the alternative is that we would transfer to a management company and again, that management company, they would have a relationship with both the local authority and the residents uh, within Coypool Park. So again, there could be that longer term um, relationship to ensure that biodiversity net gain is, is uh, achieved uh, 30 years plus in the of the scheme. Um, if I could go on to the next slide. So just in summary, some of the, the key outcomes. So at the moment, you can see 17.75% uh, biodiversity net gain. Uh, that's primarily through enhancement. We do have um, uh, compensation in terms of um, an existing bat barn and, and further um, bat boxes uh, throughout the site. Um, looking at sanctuary areas for, for the badgers um, and in terms of slow worms, protected uh, during construction and, and then reintroduced following construction work. Uh, similarly, in terms of um, construction nearest the woodland, we would be looking to undertake that with our development partner to align with nesting bird cycles. So there isn't a, a, a massive impact there. And that's obviously going down the avoid um, uh, side of things. And finally, on the northern edge of the site in particular, this links to the much wider countryside. So again, ways to um, enhance those corridors out to the wider countryside is, is key. Um, I think that's it for me. Um, I think the final slide is just a, a picture of, um, I know it's an, uh, so uh, yeah, basically um, Coypool Park, Brownfield site, but it's got uh, woodland around it, which enables um, us to uh, address biodiversity net gain on site rather than looking at off site uh, solutions. Um, thank you very much. Um, I think there's now an opportunity to go through as many question and answers as possible. So I'll, I'll pass back. Thanks very much, Paul. I think that was very brilliant. Um, I might be biased, but I think that's the best engagement we've had over the past two weeks. That does, however, mean that we're going to struggle to get through all questions. So just bear with us. We've been working hard in the background to pick out the best ones. So if everyone can just come back on camera as in speakers, please. The first one's for Martina. In built up areas, do green walls and green roofs provide meaningful net gains? I think they do. And um, I mean, if you're developing something on a roof, um, you can have something that is completely out of the way. So for invertebrates, birds, I mean, that that's fantastic. And with green walls, there are a lot of other environmental benefits that that brings with it. And um, sort of a, a passive cooling of the environment will also support your other um, green infrastructure interventions by sort of reducing the heat island effect. Um, I think there there has been a um, sort of a, a call to maybe move away from uh, urban integration and say, well, let's you know put all the money into sort of offsite uh, biodiversity um, mitigations. But I think the problem with that is that people lose access to nature, which is not good for their health, and also then we lose supporters for nature. Um, and it's really important to have those roofs as a stepping stone and then ha in integrate a connectivity into your landscape. And that can also be by retrofitting. You look at the uh, low traffic neighbourhoods and healthy streets at the moment that we have. Fantastic opportunities for retrofitting. So we have to think a bit more in the future. Let's not just think about what we're doing today, but what the vision could be for urban environments of the future. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, I'll move on to Lisa for a question. So Lisa mentioned local. Please, can you define exactly what you mean by local? Is it the same local planning authority? And how close does a site need to be to the development to be deemed appropriate for BNG offsite schemes? Well, there are um, certainly benefits to delivering um, the offsite 
um, solution as close as possible to the development site, not least because the community then sees the benefit as well, particularly if recreational opportunities can be offered. But um, sometimes the needs, the, the appropriate site might be outside the local authority boundary. Um, it might be that the site is near to that boundary and so um, there's a site that's more suitable that's closer distance wise. What happens is the biodiversity metric tool um, applies, um, remember I mentioned the risk multipliers, so if the offsets, the offsetting solution is um, a long way or out, outside of the local planning authority boundary and outside of the, the natural capital area, which is a landscape designation, then the score reduces. Um, and if it's even further away, the score reduces even further. So potentially you lose up to half of the biodiversity score if your site is a long way from um, the development site. That's the way it works. Perfect. And I'll just go back to, to Martina and perhaps Liam might want to come in on this one. Uh, and this, there's a lot of questions around urban areas because it was it's very easy to present it when it's in sort of greenfield sites. So do small sites, particularly in urban areas, provide a meaningful net gain if it's just small isolated pockets? And would it not be preferable in those cases to just buy off-site net gains? Um, I mean, I think every every scheme needs to have be judged under its own merits. But there are a lot of green deserts and, and small areas that aren't maximised that we can look to improve for community well-being, but also link them up. And that linking is so important. And that's, a, you know, if, if we go the other way, we'll end up with our sort of urban, you know, urban deserts again. Um, and we've seen in lockdown how much people actually are using um, their their area and that sometimes conflicts with biodiversity but if we have more of that space though you know be it'll be more more manageable and I think don't underestimate retrofitting and in those urban areas as well you may be more likely to get a friends off group to adopt that site so actually your management costs may be may be much smaller so I think there are lots of um, good examples why that might be be a really good thing to do but I think every site needs to be looked at on its merits and sometimes as Lisa was saying it may be a better a better idea to move off site but it should be considered. Great. There was a question in the chat about the small small sites metric as well and that's designed to be used on these on these small sites and you know and as a measure of scale the the biodiversity metric 3.0 measures things in hectares with small small site metric uses meters squared but even with that small sites metric it does still struggle with those very small sites that the con the specific context and the individual merits of the scheme and the wider environmental concerns and needs of the area really come into play there so i think the the, the key point around considering each site on its merits not underestimating the the value of green in an urban context Okay, um, I'll open this one to the floor. Um, on what basis can the LPA ask for more than 10% gain? Does anyone I can, I can, well, we have some experience of local planning authorities who through their policies, through their policy d d development, um, are asking for more. And then you may have some areas where local stakeholders um, may ask for more and then that's as it as everything is in a planning context then that's a negotiation so we have what's required in legislation but again anyone who works in the planning context will also know um, that there are negotiations based on planning policy and local stakeholder requirements that's my experience anyway okay um paul this and, uh, just just jumping into that james um i, I suppose if if you are a developer and you have a site which is able to achieve more than 10% biodiversity net gain, there may well be a, um, advantages to doing that because you can then work with um, maybe some other uh, developers in the area that aren't able to meet their biodiversity net gain. So there's there's potentially a um, a, a discussion at best or a negotiation at worst to to um, achieve that. So um, I, I wouldn't underestimate that going forward. That's really good the, the yeah, value so of just having green space for its own sake that if you are going above that 10 percent requirement that you know the the value to if it's housing development um the value to the local residents to having that accessibility to biodiversity space may add its own intrinsic value beyond just you know it's good to do it so you know the the wider benefits are there to be seen in terms of pr and all that sort of thing as well and and just adding to that i think you you can also bank those credits as an as an organization and use them yourself for something else 
Um, but again, I think that would be down to stakeholder negotiation as well. Perfect. And I think there's another one for Paul that you might want to come in on. Are there any examples of how the monitoring or management schemes on emerging sites have successfully delivered a measurable net gain against key indicators? Um, I'm not, to be honest. It does feel kind of probably too early to, to have good examples um, going forward. Um, I suppose what I can say is that on a number of Homes England sites, um, we are obviously looking to deliver at, at least 10% by zero as a net gain. So in, in able, being able to um, approach that on a comprehensive manner for the agency, a you know, big landowner um, across the country, um, there doesn't seem to be anything in terms of us stopping being able to share that knowledge and experience going forward. So um, it may well be that maybe at the next one of these learning events, we can pick that up and share that knowledge and experience for, for partners to pick up. Definitely, that sounds like a good idea. Lisa, larger areas of green spaces, especially woodlands with footpaths open to the public, has an impact on higher management charges, public liability insurance, etc. if the areas are to be maintained by a manco. This will affect the affordable housing residents and add to their housing costs. Are there any schemes which would take on responsibility of the woodlands? And there are a number of organisations that are able to take on responsibility and thinking um, the, the Land Trust and other comparable um, organisations and that they take those potentially under a, a dowry model. But again, it does come down to sort of um, the developer taking the financial responsibility for those. So um, yeah, something to, to be looked at in more detail, I think, again, on a site by site basis. And there's just a question that came up a couple of times, which I recall a few people are asking how they can get training or any courses to bring them up to speed on biodiversity net gain. Does anyone want to point out any sites or any companies offering that sort of thing? Uh, CIE and the, so the Chartered Institute of uh, College of Environmental Managers have a number of courses available on biodiversity training at a range of scale. So introduction to, you know, particular habitat assessments and that sort of thing. Um, there's a for the rivers um, element of the assessment, there's specific training that's required for that as well to use um, a software called Cartographer um, that runs through the um, I think it's modular, modular River Server, I think is the name of the website, but, but those are the main two that I'd, um, I'm aware of anyway. And also the planning advisory service is uh, delivering a project on behalf of DEFRA, which is specifically targeting local authority planners. So we've included the link in the, uh, the slide we'll send around afterwards, but that's got um, recordings from um, sessions for local uh, planners and also a long list of FAQs. So um, definitely worth having a look at that after the session. Great. Um, so let's see what else do we have. Um, Will developers, and this one can go to floor, but I've got Lisa down. Will developers be required to fund 30 years of maintenance and monitoring? Yeah, so that's what's involved really in securing that 30 years of um, BNG. Um, the government consultation, which is out at the moment, um, gives a bit more detail about the uh, mechanisms that are available to that. So I think the expectation in the consultation at the moment is that conditions or obligations or conservation covenants will need to be in place in order to ensure that particularly off-site and credits and also significant on-site elements are secured in that way. So parks and meadows man to be managed for biodiversity or a mix of biodiversity and recreation, they'll also need to be secured. Perfect. I think there was a question in the chat throughout that talked about how we can become uh, more multidisciplinary in the way that we address biodiversity net gain. So do you see it becoming more obvious that there are different ways rather than what is currently offered to co contribute to your biodiversity net gain? Um, so I think you talked about bird habitats and bad, uh, bat habitats and that kind of thing. Do you mean artificial habitats? Uh, yes. I mean, I think the problem with artificial habitats um, and where we may have actually gone a little bit wrong in the past is protecting individual species and protecting their places of shelter when um, their place of shelter isn't any use to them if they don't have any habitat in which to live. So I think that's why it's a habitat based approach. Um, but in terms of being sort of multidisciplinary, I think they're looking at it from an ecosystem service and natural capital approach then that actually lends you to not only working with different disciplines to maximise 
your biodiversity net gain, but also look at your your carbon reduction aspirations and your water resilience, etc. So I think I would look forward to a time where all of these things were considered in a holistic fashion, which will make achieving biodiversity net gain um, much, much easier and potentially give additionality in terms of funding. So you will get you will get a, hopefully additional credits for the other the other me measures that you're producing. So in some of the funding questions, some of that funding, for example, for farmers can be through uh, positive farming practices funding. So that would actually reduce the cost, obviously, to the developers. So when you're working out a scheme, then you want to look at something, for example, if it could be a, a living working farm and um, get additional credits. And there are circumstances where that's available for other types of land use too. Perfect. Um, Martina and Lisa, this one might be for you too. You can't guarantee a friends of group will remain in existence long enough, so surely the LA will need to ask for management fees on the assumption, assumption management could revert to them at any time. Do you agree? I think there's, there's different ways of approaching it. So um, if the developer wants to take on the keep the risk, the developer can um, assure that the management will happen and have a relationship with the friends of, of group. Um, and then the developer takes that risk. Otherwise, I guess the developer can offer a sum to the local planning authority and to, to manage it. Um, and I guess the trade off would be that you might get it cheaper, um, but you will then have to take on take on management or have that negotiation later. So I think it probably depends on the circumstance. Great. Um, just a couple more and then we'll go to the feedback. Um, Paul, there are a few points in the chat around the need for case studies, exemplars, documents to share as good practice. Um, for example, are there some tried and tested management agreements for future management plans, particularly interested in the friends of type of partner? Um, do you know of any steers or signposting for good practice or templates? And I know you've already said that there will be lots more in the future, but just at the moment. Um, so, so a couple of things there. So um, the Land Trust is definitely a, a good good organisation to um, have a look at their website, get in contact with the regional contact for um, people's areas. Um, they, they've they got a very strong grasp on long-term management and um, biodiversity net gain and how they can go hand in hand with one another. The other thing I, I'd want to mention is that within Homes England, we are looking at long term management and stewardship arrangements. We did do some work quite a long time ago looking at management companies and um, community led um, uh, um, kind of friends of groups. And we're looking to refresh that and update it and biodiversity net gain to be part of that. So again, something for us to definitely um, be able to share once it once it comes to fruition. Perfect. Um, perhaps Liam could come in on this one. How do you establish a value for a 30 year management plan? So I think this is going to be very context dependent given what the requirement is, what the management would be for and what the organisation is that are doing it. So the organisation that are doing it will have to provide you know work out for themselves how much it'll think them how much it'll cost them to do it and equally how much the developer is prepared to pay for it and then at that point it'll become a negotiation great um i think we've come to the end of the q a now so thanks for everyone's time and all your contributions before we leave the session we'd just like to hear a bit from you so thanks to liam martina paul and lisa for delivering a brilliant session if we could just go to the next slide, please. So this is the take home messages slide I told you about. We've got the top five tips from our speakers, so you can go and read those yourself. They're just going to help you in the coming months with biodiversity net game. We had a couple of questions, as I've said, on key organisations. So we've put a few links in the top right for you. And then there's the wider learning. I imagine that will expand over the coming months, but that's some some sites just to get you started. So if we just go to the last slide. So a big thank you, a big thank you to our speakers. Once again, they put a lot of effort into this presentation. They've answered loads of questions. Thanks to the audience for attending. It's been a really brilliant session. 
If you have any questions, please email that email that you see right in the centre there and we will do our best to get back to you. So if you have any burning questions about biodiversity net gain, which we didn't get around to, please send it to that address, which is cce at homesengland.gov.uk. And you can also, of course, get in touch with your relationship manager. So thanks, everyone. We'll call it a day there. And we hope to see you later this afternoon for our next session. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.